Now, Yuri Prokasov will uh, take over. He will present the talk. He, uh, pre he prepared the talk together, of course, with Werner and also with Andre Weber from his group. And I will give you a short introduction about Yuri Prokasov. So today is the day of the, or at least this, this session of the engineers and physicists. So Yuri is a physicist, physicist. he studied in Moscow. And then he went over to Germany and uh, he started um, already a long time ago, ago in Werner Zuschrater's lab in 2005 in Magdeburg. And he is, uh, his focus is in software development um, for the determination analysis of the space coordinates together with very precise timing information. So that's very important, of course, for any FLIM measurements. And um, since 2017, he is a managing director of Photon Score. And Photon Score is a company, it's a spin off from the Leibniz Institute in Magdeburg, where Werner is located. And so now he is really developing his or their um, film camera there. And I guess he will give a, a very nice introduction about his camera or, or their camera technique now. Okay, so Yuri, you Thank you, Stefan. Stage. Thank you. Um, I will try to share the screen. I hope it works. Please tell me if it doesn't. That looks very good. Wonderful. So, uh, yeah, I will talk about uh, single photon counting, but position resolved uh, single photon counting. So, uh, just a few words how it works. Well, we develop camera that is looks like just ordinary camera with C mount, uh, and from my experience, when I say camera, everyone immediately have this image in mind, a pixels of CCD camera. What you do, you expose it to the light for some time, then you read it out. And then what you're interested in is what is the resolution, namely how many pixels I have there and how many frames per second I can acquire from that. Well, in our case, we don't even have a concept of pixel. What we have is when we get a click of the photon, we have X and Y positions. We have delta T that is relative to the laser pools and we have absolute arrival time. When we get the next click, next photon is arriving. So we, we store X and Y, delta T and uh, another time and so on and so on and so on until we get enough photons to get an image. So therefore, we don't store pixels, so we don't have a concept of neither pixel, no frame. What we store is X, Y position of a photon. If you want, in other words, we have like single pixel, but with thousand sub pixels that grants us roughly a megapixel resolution. To form a frame, we just have to bind the photons uh, on the basis of their arrival time. And if you think a little bit that intensity is nothing else, just a number of photons that hit that pixel or beam. So what we can do with that, we can make or build associated list of the photons that corresponds to that particular beam. So at the end, what we store, we store individual photons, one after another in a long list. We build histograms to make frames. And we frame intensity in terms of time to build finally movies or to build film movies. So here are the applications where we involved through all these years. So uh, we will highlight some of them. And so one second of advertisement. So very welcome for Friday afternoon for the workshop where we'll, we will present some of them more in details. Well, what you can do with that, you can do fluorescence lifetime imaging, obviously. Uh, what we do, we count photons. And for every single pixel, we uh, acquire such a decay. Then what we can do, we can use statistical analysis to resolve those components. And coming back to the 
individual pixels uh, resolving the mixture of different chromophores that are made of uh, or that are present in this sample. Uh, one exciting example is, of course, a uh, flame thread of uh, biosensors. In this cartoon, you can see LCK kinase molecule marked with ECFP YFP that is well known to be as a classical thread sensor. Uh, when the molecule is folded, that is in natural uh, form of it, we can observe strong thread signal between CFP and YFP. Upon the activation, the uh, cell starts immune response reactions and consequently the uh, this molecule unfolds and thread signal vanishes. On this image, you can see uh, the thread recovery after initial antigen presentation, and the recovery takes approximately 20 minutes. So this work is um, already published. And uh, we went further and having actually Position-sensitive sensor or camera pushes us to apply it for various kinds of uh, 3D sectioning techniques. On this movie to the right, you can see the flame image uh, of or confocal flame image acquired with uh, a spinning disk. So you can see 20 slices with approximately half a minute per slice, and this is intensity weighted mean lifetime. Uh, what we did, we just uh, used uh, Yokohawa spinning disk and sorry guys from Hamamatsu, we just dropped out your camera, put our and uh, we did the flim. We did confocal flim, time resolved confocal flim with the spinning disk. More importantly, this uh, unit is equipped with super resolution uh, extension that thus we can do uh, so-called, yeah, rescanning flame or rescanning super-resolution flame. Um, another, uh, as a follow-up uh, to go in direction of super-resolution, uh, we exploit so-called metal-induced energy transfer, or MIT. I will just give short introduction. So when we have a fluorescent sample, uh, the chromophores are situated in different depths. And if we coat the cover sleeve with a thin gold surface, that this surface acts as an acceptor in classical threat measurement. Thus, we can trade the lifetime to the super resolved axial uh, position. Here on this cartoon, you can see actin filaments uh, that are uh, forming wave-like structures. So you can clearly to the right see different uh, decay angles or different lifetimes that corresponds to closer to the surface or further from the surface uh, molecules situated in the sample. And the, these filaments are pretty thin, so it's rather like um, film structure, film-like structure. And uh, yeah, coming back to our old friend LCK, we did also TIRF that is feasible with white field. So to the left, you can see conventional epifluorescence image and to the right, you can see TIRF that provides much better contrast. Then we do, um, so here you can see the mixture just of mean lifetime and intensity. What we did here, we did uh, maximum entropy-like analysis, and then we just declared, okay, let's say some chromophores are fast, some are slow. Thus, we can make separation of the molecules that are really close to the surface because these lymphocytes are really love to touch, and you, you can see strong quenching of uh, GFP molecules that are actually this LCK was marked with, and the rest of the sample that is uh, above this uh, threshold. Uh, important to mention, this MITE effect is extremely sensitive and the depth is roughly corresponding to the uh, depth of TIRF effect that is uh, in the range of a few hundred nanometers. 
Another fascinating application that we uh, went through recently, this is uh, single molecule detection. On this foil, you can see uh, three dyes, Psi-5, Auto-655 and Auto-647, that are spectrally really, really close together. They're all red, uh, but they have significant difference in lifetimes. And in the second measurement, the um, a mixture of, of all these molecules put together into sample were measured and it was demonstrated that um, you can exploit lifetime to really separate molecules in order to do super resolution also in XY. Um, this work was published and what is really amazing that the authors claimed two, three orders of magnitude faster acquisition compared to scanning approaches that is makes white field really attractive. And then we were asking, okay, why it is? What you can see here to the right, this is uh, the noise that the camera produces for the whole field of view within one second. Yes, this is thousand by thousand bins. Yes, this is zero and this is one. I don't know if you actually see it through the translation, but here, the intensity image we get within one second. And here is flame image we get within one second. Well, it's quite noisy, so we can rebin it to gain a little bit more contrast. So it's all about signal. Yeah, so you need better quantum efficiency, you can increase power, you can have brighter sample, but what actually counts, and this is not a secret formula, it's actually the ratio between signal and noise. And another way to increase signal to noise is reduce noise. And actually this is what is uh, in the conclusion of this paper that really signal to noise counts, not the signal alone. Because uh, the photocassettes we use, they are uh, quite weak in red uh, area and we can nicely see uh, red dyes and discriminate them and measure lifetimes and process the data. Um, coming back to the spinning disk story. So this was a warm invitation of Olympus Europe. And there we, we as I mentioned, we just exchanged and this was really dropping replacement of conventional CCD camera with the time resolved clean cam. Here you can see the, uh, a single slice of neural culture uh, marked uh, by two markers. One is for nuclei and another marker was specific for synapses. What we did, we did our normal business. We fitted the uh, decay. We came back to the, uh, we did so-called global fitting. We came back to the individual pixels. And uh, by the construction of the sample, we know that the uh, nuclei and synapses, they are clearly separated by the design of the uh, transfection. Therefore, we can come back from uh, mean lifetime, we can increase the information, extract more information by using multi-component analysis. And this insert, you can see that clearly we can gain extra information comparing to average lifetime or mean lifetime. Uh, this is another sample of, uh, yeah, just another glass from the same preparation. So just to conclude, uh, photon counting brings a lot of information and therefore it requires some statistics uh, to extract all of that, to visualize invisible of what we, uh, this is actually what was demonstrated here. Well, another uh, obvious choice is slide sheet microscopy. So in this uh, photo, you can see ultrascope from, from La Vision where we made this measurement. So actually this part is on my background. I, I hope you see it. And uh, here, what we did at the end is, hello? Yeah, 
it runs. So you can see that we uh, we separated simply we we made kind of continuous feed of all the lifetimes, starting from one to ten nanoseconds, and then uh, within five hundred picoseconds steps to make it nice and colorful with switch on and switch off different channels. So this is a, a clear red, uh, red embryo, uh, pretty old one, but uh, you see this is a rather macroscopic application of FLIM. And uh, yeah, this is maximum projection showing uh, nearly all spectrum of lifetimes encoded with colors through the whole uh, sample. Uh, we also tried uh, LightSheet like, like a platform and uh, OpenSpin. Uh, this is a work published by Pavel Tomczak from Dresden, Max Planck Institute. Coming back to yesterday, so we saw actually this was this section we added just uh, after yesterday's session. So we saw this sort of interest in uh, spectral resolve flame. Uh, for LCK, we used a CFP YFP couple that is known that uh, M Torquas dye has higher quantum yield and uh, brighter and more stable. So therefore, we used uh, imaging spectrometer where one axis vertical in this case we put uh, position and the wavelength is the second axis. When we measure the sample that uh, consists of 22 amino acids as a spacer between uh, turquoise and venous molecules, we can see clear thread or spectral thread uh, image. So in fact, if you have imaging spectrometer, you can simply with a scan, you can acquire hyperspectral uh, flame image uh, with uh, time resolution. Yeah. And this is just the conclusion of, uh, of this experiment or of this measurement, MTORQS alone as a control and MTORQS uh, Venus pair to, that demonstrates threat. Uh, another application of this uh, spectrometric uh, method was done in collaboration with uh, Astrophysics Institute in Potsdam. Um, they make research in some kind of really, really, really strange species. It's called Antarctic bacteria. I was told that these bacteria can survive outer space. So really they send a sample to uh, International Space Station and put it outside for some time. They came back and they were pretty much alive. So that is quite scary. But what we did, we wanted to, to uh, get uh, Raman signatures. So for that we used uh, a slit under the microscope and we directed the light from that slit into spectrometer. Therefore, we get uh, position and the wavelengths in a single, as a single image on the camera. Uh, then we did our uh, normal analysis, uh, resolving four different components. And we can go back and make it colorful. And it's well known that uh, cyanobacteria is, uh, yeah, it's photosynthetic bacteria. And this area of uh, really deep red components uh, belongs to the fluorescence from photosynthetic complexes. And this is the range where is so-called fingerprint area of Raman signal. Uh, if we put them together, you can see clear improvement of the uh, signal to noise ratio by doing this multi exponential statistical analysis. And this is ongoing work to uh, employ it for Raman imaging. Um, another application that might be uh, or would be discussed in follow-up uh, talks, I'm really looking forward to hear it, it's um, metabolic imaging. And what we do, we use a uh, uh, pulsed uh, laser source of 355 nanometers, that is UV, uh, to illuminate the sample. And it's known that um, 
first NADH uh, has basically two forms, bound and protein bound and free NADH. And inside those free NADH, you can resolve actually two different conformations, so-called close and open conformations that differ by lifetime. In this experiment, you can see the uh, almost roughly one hour measurement of different metabolic states of yeast colony. Uh, you see aerobic and aerobic state. And the most interesting part is this part with oscillations, so somewhere in the middle. So where the cells, this colony of the cells, starts to consume glucose and uh, they do it in synchrony, surprisingly. And the synchronization factor actually depends on the concentration, so how distant molecules are from each other. Here you can see the NADH signal from a single cell, from a single yeast cell. So we acquired uh, some thousand photons from it and still we can do quite good uh, separation analysis of uh, different, uh, different species of NADH or different forms of NADH, better to say. And where the, well, I was, Andre, still uh, part of Institute for Neurobiology, and therefore we did correlative NADH FAD uh, electrophysiological measurement. And this measurement was done on um, uh, cell culture, and this black dot in the middle, you can see this electrode that you can measure the signal or you can stimulate the, the uh, neurons. On top, you see nearly four hours measurement of the, uh, uh, of the neural activity correlated with electrical signal and the consumption of energy, that is NADH signal. Uh, so uh, these are just movies to say, uh, to show you how on video this uh, metabolic oscillation works. So to the left, you can see the Mean lifetime to the right is intensity only, that is, was also measurement for many hours. And with these colonies, you can observe that this work was recently published, uh, these metabolic waves, that is, result in cell-to-cell -cell communication in a structure. So if you want, as a analogy, this is maybe the first evolutionary social behavior of a living species. Yeah? but as a joke. So I wish to thank uh, all these people who contributed to the data we presented. Uh, we thank uh, the funding, of course, and special thanks to Olympus Europe and uh, Omicron Laser uh, for providing continuous support and uh, making it possible. Ah, yeah, so just to remind you, it's really, I don't know why it's Friday afternoon, but warm welcome if you have like spent and yeah, part of the evening with us, very welcome. And thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Yuri, for the very nice presentation about the camera you are offering and also further developing, I guess. Mm. Okay. We have, um, ah, yeah, we have two questions here from the audience. More questions coming up. So the first one was from Joel. And this is about the MIET, the metal induced energy transfer. Yes. And she's asking, what do you need as extra components um, other than the gold cover, cover slip for doing MIET? Might. Mm, this is actually the beauty of this method that you can use uh, any chromophore you have in your library. Nothing special, just gold coating, but practically it's not that easy to, uh, to coat the gold. If you have any physicist around, ask them, it's normally titanium and gold on top to make it stable. Okay, and then we have a yeah a more basic and, question. And uh, basically, uh, w one more um, uh, remark because uh, yeah, I just read the question. Uh, no, you don't need any special microscope. Okay. Any fluorescent microscope uh, will do the job with any dye. The only trick you have to culture yourselves in such a 
chamber or just put them there. Okay, so the next question is more a basic question, and but this will anyway be helpful for um, um, the whole afternoon because we will have more of this kind of, of, of applications. It's about, can you explain again, what is the principle behind NAD pH and use changes in lifetime? What's going on there just from the physiology? It's, uh, yeah, the most basic process is energy consumption. So therefore you have, so the cell binds uh, NADH to the proteins in order to consume the energy or to produce energy, you have more free NADH and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, that's why you, you see these oscillations because basically you measure the ratio or you see the ratio between free and bound NADH that it corresponds to different metabolic states. Okay, thanks for this. And then um, uh, directly following the technical question, what kind of excitation source do you use for NADH measurement? And um, this question is popping up twice. So people are interested in how do you do it? Uh, so there are two sources. One is really historic laser that is unfortunately out of production. Uh, this was uh, custom built short harmonic generation from, uh, uh, it was uh, five, high Q laser, the Sostring company, and they build a, a solid state laser with third harmonic generation. Nowadays, you can use a white light laser with UV, UV extension mm -hmm. that, or even diode laser with 375, it's enough. It's enough oh. to, to get quite good excitation of NADH. Okay. So for, so for the diet, unfortunately, it's physically limited to 375, as I know, by physics, by nature. So you couldn't make a crystal that is uh, ha emits lower. Okay. So then about the light sheet based flim system, what kind of applications you have used for the system? Uh, Applications. So first, uh, we tried uh, with this macroscopic application. Well, honestly, to make nice pictures, uh, it's this was just demonstration. So uh, because people were curious about uh, about if it's feasible to do light sheet, and the answer was yes. So yeah. we have to demonstrate yes. Yeah, but it's ob obvious to try out everything. What is um based on camera techniques, why right. not using a flimp right. or doing it? So and there, there is certain difference between obvious and make it done. Yeah. And but I'm happy to share these beautiful images. Yeah. I mean, actually I have a question in the same direction because I mean, if you use a camera system, you think you are super, super fast in the end. So you have super temporal resolution. And uh, I mean, you, you, also showed one application where you have been interested in, in higher temporal resolution in comparison to a point scanning system. Um, yeah, can you comment on this? Are you always faster? Did you, I mean, in the end, everything depends on how many photons you get out. Well, uh, it's German session, so the answer is Jain. <laughs> <laughs> um, it depends. It really depends on uh, first uh, spectrum, what kind of uh, uh, spectral range you are using. It depends on uh, because uh, it's always trade off. There is no silver bullet, unfortunately, or happily. Uh, we are fast because we use these multi alkali photocathodes that are extremely fast, but they have. Uh, certainly less quantum efficiency than semiconductor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it also depends on the experiment because uh, in case of single molecules, you're extremely fast because what we do, we just wait photon to come to us. We're not hunting the, those molecules with the laser beam running through the field of view. And this makes it difference really crucial. But if you think and you make such a hypothetical experiment and putting more and more and more molecules, 
eventually, so if we have single molecule, just one molecule in the field of view, of course we are faster because you have to scan through the whole field of view to hit that molecule. When you put second one, third one, and so on, until uh, the probability to hit it with the scanner will be the same as uh, just wait for the photon from there. I would say so when the um, number of active pixels is below, I think 70%, that was estimation, uh, we're faster. If you have super bright sample or you have long enough time to wait, the scanner, of course, uh, does the job. Okay, yeah, thank you. So it's really worth to try it out, maybe direct comparison in one system. <laughs> um, Absolutely. We, we, we were discussing, I guess, this for again, some time yes, already. We will do it. Maybe if we can do the symposium in reality, or at least as a hybrid symposium, we should go for it. This so will be pleasure. More questions to come. Again, it's MIET film experiment. Is it possible to calibrate with 124 in gold coating and apply that in lifestyle experiments in gold coated cover slips? So that's about calibration process. Um, this is actually a good question because if depends what would you like to measure? Because for, uh, if you look at the formal, if you look at the original paper from Alexei, Alexei, I, I forgot, unfortunately, the last name of, of the guy, he, uh, uh, from the group of York Anderland, they uh, made uh, simulations also, and all this quantum physics, uh, um, uh, solving of, of, the, of the problem and there is one parameter that is uh, absolute quantum yield of the die unfortunately if you want to get accurate nanometers like in nanometers if you are making a relative measurement this is the best you can do you can just uh, go with uh, some die and then you, you observe the changes so if the lifetime changes two times, then you know, okay, this is two times. But calibration is necessary if you would like to get nanometers, like in nanometers. So this is similar to fret efficiency because there is this R0 parameter. How you get R0? Well, you guess it or you model it or you... Yeah. This is really similar. This is really similar that... There is one unknown uh, you have to compromise on. Okay. And it's, it's answers. Yeah, it's all about calibration always. If you want to be super precise, you need to calibrate. Very good. Exactly. So next question is, um, yeah, if you analyze Four components, if you want to identify four components, how many photons per pixel are needed if you really do it pixel-wise? Can this photon number be acquired within one second? Again, it's all about how many photons. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a good statistical question. Fair answer, I don't know. Uh, second derivative for Fisher information matrix, yeah, or diagonal. Uh, but in reality, uh, come on, we, we have to be practical. So uh, you just look at dispersion. If you're happy with the numbers, it's fine. But for, for, for component analysis, right, you need thousands, really thousands. And this is math. It's statistics. You couldn't overcome it. Okay. Uh, okay. The, 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 the precise number, it's, well... It depends on uh, also how close are these components are. If you want to do like, I don't, I don't know, 100 picoseconds and five nanoseconds, it's a huge difference. You don't need much. Yeah. If you want to distinguish between one and three, well, doable. Two and two and a half, well, then you need a lot of statistics. Yeah. So is the, it depends on question uh, one is, interested to answer. Yeah, okay. 
So, and then Stefan is asking, can you explain the technology of the camera within one minute or shall we leave it for the workshop? That people really, people really uh, join the workshop on Friday or Ooh. is it possible to do this very fast? Minute? Challenging bots can do. Okay. Uh, let me check. Uh, well, I can do one second, just go to the YouTube, uh, but <laughs> I, 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 can <laughs> I can do right now. Uh, just give me uh, just one second and uh, yeah, that's good enough. Um, open computers. It, 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 it opened and, uh, and I have to click sharing, right? Right. Hold share screen yeah this screen share i hope you see it yes. right okay. um running yeah so for intensity you need some kind of element you expose it to the light you wait for some time you get electrons you get you feed it to a dc you get the call with photon counting you need some amplifier that gives you a lot of electrons in you have timing. This is a photo of real MCP PMT that we use. And inside there are three key elements is photocathode, microchannel plate, and the anode. And it works like that, like shown in this cartoon. So incident photon hits out photoelectron, and then this avalanche is going is driven to the um, anode. And uh, what is going on? So this MCPs are our amplifying element that for a single initial carrier, we can get up to, oh, animation is really slow, I see on the second screen. Uh, but yeah, this is real photo of real uh, microchannel plates. So what happens next, uh, before spets came around, people were using it to measure timing. So what you do, you just acquire this avalanche and you get already pretty nice timing instrument. But what we want to do, we want to do time and position simultaneously. And on this cartoon to the left, you can see the easiest, well, the simplest would be Mercedes anode, because you need at least three electrodes to get to be able to resolve X and Y. But the idea behind this formula is rather simple to acquire X position. What you do, you sum up the charges Q1 and Q4 that is to the right from the line of origin, subtract what is to the left related to the uh, total charge, and you get quite nice position in units from minus one to plus one. The same you do for the uh, vertical position and you get timing one after another one after another this is basically the principle that is behind the uh, uh, inside the heart of the of the detector okay but i guess you will explain it again in detail in the workshop on friday very welcome yeah. thank you very much so thank you now,